So uh, what I was about to say, talk about is the principle of variation, which is Shakespeare's method of writing a speech in which two things are happening. Number one, he says the same thing many times because when we speak, or even when we think, we don't perfectly encapsulate our thought on the first shot and then stop. As I'm about to do, we say things several times. We stop, we start, we stop, we start, we go back, we try it a different way. People begin to understand us, we give, an, we give them another way of looking at it, and eventually the idea gets across. And that makes it realistic, makes the speech realistic, because Shakespeare goes through a speech saying the same thing in several different ways, um, as with a violist speech that I read last week, and maybe I'll, uh, we'll look at it again, um, so that it seems like somebody really talking and really thinking. And that lends a kind of authenticity and realism to the, um, to the speech. I'm going to close this door. But then at the same time, that allows him to bring in a whole lot of different poetic metaphors. So when he's saying the same thing several times, it sounds realistic, but it also gives us all kinds of different avenues to get at the idea of the speech. This is an idea straight from C.S. Lewis. He has a whole essay on this technique of variation, he calls it. And it's, it's a way of achieving what I've been saying all my teaching life about Shakespeare, which is that he is able to give us, in one experience, two complete, completely different kinds of meaning. One is universal significance, and the other is immediate empathic experience. So that he makes his characters completely believable because they're realistic human beings talking the way we talk in some sense. And at the same time with this technique of variation, he's giving us these, all these metaphors that are pointing to a kind of universal significance. And so <clears throat> the combination of this allows his plays to become for us both totally believable and totally meaningful. And this is a, uh, um, the high period of this achievement, and Shakespeare's the greatest at it. Um, earlier than Shakespeare, the, pre, the, the, the predisposition was to universal meaning. So you have kind of generalized morality plays, like Every Man, which is about every man. And, you know, the characters are named things like friendship and kin and cousin and goods, worldly goods and good deeds and knowledge. <clears throat> That's what we, all we get from them. Uh, and it's because that's universally significant and that's what they cared about. And if you turn on the television now, or the movies, what do you get? You get, you know, Joseph H. Smith III driving a Mustang uh, along the outer drive of Chicago in 1978, you know, with a girlfriend named Joyce, and we're gonna find out exactly who these real people are and we're supposed to identify with them because they're so, slice of life realistic. So the, the history of, uh, of European uh, drama just goes in this kind of arc from the more gnomic, the more universal, the more uh, morality play style to the more slice of life realism. And Shakespeare is at the kind of pivot point of this and he achieves both completely in the same set of words, in one play, in, the, in one character, in one moment. Not even alternating, just at the same time. <clears throat> so I'll try to show you examples of that as we go. Um, and I, I can't remember what a question that was answering, but the, the point is that he's, he's doing this double thing to us. And this is why we find it so valuable. Because when we see a general play like every man, we come out and we go, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's what I was taught. And when we see Slice of Life, we say, well, I get those guys, but what's that got to do with me? Those are the dangers of those things. Of course, the best modern things are also meaningful, and the best morality plays and early things are, are, are also 
uh, convincing in their way um, because they believed in those things. They believed you could only take good deeds with you when you went to death. And so when you see good deeds going to death, that's kind of moving for them. But uh, Shakespeare does it together in one and, and triumphs at this uh, subtle art. We don't know really of anybody else who's achieved it in the same degree. So the other one, another thing he does, so I'm gonna do two things tonight. I, I want, we skipped kind of lightly through the play on Tuesday uh, for thematic reasons. And now I'd like to spend some time reading particular speeches and just looking at them and answering questions. Um, but I also want to cover a couple of general ideas, and that was one of them. <clears throat> the second one is the relation between prose and verse. So <clears throat> I will say generally that um, there's a lot of prose in this play. Um, generally, the point about the relation, so let me explain what I mean by prose and verse. Prose means Paragraphs, talking, the way we talk, not metrical, not rhyming, right? Just paragraphs. And verse is, in Shakespeare, usually iambic pentameter, unless it's a song and it might be a tetrameter or a trimeter, and it might be rhymed or not rhymed, but generally it's unrhymed iambic pentameter called blank verse. And, the, and all the plays have both. Um, some plays are more prosy than versified, and some are more verse than prose. They all have both, and they all have both because it is a useful technique for Shakespeare to shift from one to the other. So the general motion, when you're going from prose to verse, is from the more mundane, the more personal, the more comical, the less serious, toward the more universal, the more profound, the more serious, the more public, the more official, the deeper. Not that there isn't depth in a lot of Shakespeare's prose. And vice versa, when you're changing from verse to prose, you're usually going from a big dramatic heavy scene with main characters to a maybe comical scene or maybe uh, a subplot scene with people in a more intimate setting or more comical setting, more less serious, <clears throat> not, not less serious thematically, but less weighty in terms of style. So I'm gonna just show you an example of this because uh, in act one, scene five, you remember that Viola dressed now as Cesario, looking like her brother. We haven't seen him yet. Um, have we seen him yet? I think we haven't seen him yet. Yeah, we haven't seen him yet. So we'll see that he looks exactly like her when he comes in later. Um, but she has been sent by Orsino to Olivia to win Olivia over to Ors Orsino's love. And they're exchanging uh, conversation in prose. So if you go to act one, scene five, um, Let's start with Olivia at line 196 or so. They make a she makes a couple jokes and Olivia says in prose, sure you have some hideous matter to deliver when the courtesy of it is so fearful. Speak your office. Violet, it alone concerns your ear. I bring no overture of war, no taxation of homage. I hold the olive in my hand, symbol of peace. My words are as full of peace as matter. Olivia, yet you began rudely. What are you? What would you? What would you means what do you want? What's the subtitle of the play? What you will. So what would you is a play on that idea. What, what are you after? Viola, the rudeness that hath appeared in me have I learned from my entertainment. That's the way you treated me. What I am and what I would are as secret as maidenhead. To your ears, divinity. To any others, profanation. So Olivia says, give us the place alone. We will hear this divinity. Now, sir, what is your text? And Viola begins with formality. Most sweet lady, and Olivia interrupts her. A comfortable doctrine, because they've been talking about divinity, right? Profanity versus divinity. 
a comfortable doctrine, and much may be said of it. Where lies your text? Viola goes out of her part in Orsino's bosom. In his bosom, in what chapter of his bosom? We're talking like, you know, this is a lesson in divinity. Uh, to answer by the method in the first of his heart. Oh, says Olivia, I have read it. It is heresy. Have you no more to say? Viola, good madam, let me see your face. Olivia, have you any commission from your lord to negotiate with my face? Because she's been veiled up until now. You are now out of your text, but we will draw the curtain and show you the picture. So she's treating her face as a picture, takes the curtain away. Look you, sir, such a one I was this present. Is it not well done? It's exactly the way you would show a painting, a portrait of someone. You take away the curtain. Doesn't this look exactly like she looked in life? Do you remember Browning has a whole poem about that called My Last Duchess? Great poem. Viola says, excellently done, if God did all, meaning if you're not wearing makeup, if it's not all rouge and lipstick and <clears throat> Tis in grain, sir, to will endure wind and weather. <clears throat> now watch what happens. Tis beauty truly blent, whose red and white, nature's own sweet and cunning hand laid on. Lady, you are the cruelest she alive, <clears throat> if you will lead these graces to the grave and leave the world no copy. Bum, bum, bum. So what has she done? <coughs> After all that chatter, she's now shifted into verse, and it's weighty. She's really saying, making a moral statement. In fact, it's a statement very much like um, those in the, earth, the first 17 sonnets of Shakespeare in the sonnet collection he wrote. Um, not collection, but sequence. Um, you're, you're young, you're handsome, you're beautiful, you should have a child. You should get married and have a child. If you don't, your beauty's gonna go to the grave and won't be reproduced. So Viola is saying that to Olivia. And Olivia isn't buying it. She's not going into verse. She stays in prose. Oh, sir, I will not be so hard-hearted. I will give out diverse schedules of my beauty, lists and reports. Like in a will, it shall be inventoried and every particle and utensil labeled to my will. As item, two lips in different red, item, two gray eyes with lids to them, item, one neck, one chin, and so forth. That's in response to this idea of leaving the world no copy. Were you sent hither to praise me? So Olivia is debunking uh, Viola's attempt, and she's debunking, I mean, Viola Cesario's um, mission, but she's treating her, metaphorically, we don't think she's really stupid, she knows that beauty fades eventually, but she doesn't, she, does, she knows it intellectually, but she's not living it. And she's treating it as if she could leave her qualities to someone in her will, at what you will, and of course she can't. And she knows it intellectually, but she's, She's forgetting it. So Viola says, back in verse now, I see you what you are. You are too proud. But if you were the devil, you are fair. My Lord and Master loves you. Oh, such love could be but recompense though you were crowned the nonpareil of beauty. If there were nobody more beautiful than you, he, it would be barely enough to recompense how much he loves you. The non parel of beauty, how does he love me? Suddenly, she's dragged into verse, into a different level of conversation. Viola, with adorations, with fertile tears, with groans that thunder love, with sighs of fire. And she, Olivia, still in verse, your Lord does know my mind, I cannot love him. Yet I suppose him virtuous, Know him noble, of great estate, of fresh and stainless youth, in voices well divulged, free, learned, and valiant, and in dimension and the shape of nature, a gracious person. He's good looking too. But yet I cannot love him. He might have took his answer long ago. Why can't she love him? Well, she's still in mourning. 
yeah, but we know that that's ridiculous because she's b planning to be in mourning for seven years. Why? How does she know that? Because where is he? <laughs> Not here. He's sending this boy to come and woo for him. He's not doing it. So she can't, she's not responding. There's nothing there to respond to. It's all abstract. And she knows abstractly that he's all these great things, but she's not into it. And she's not into it because she's foolishly stuck in this morning, but also because he's not doing anything to break her out of it. Right? Okay, so Viola says, if I did love you in my master's flame, with such a suffering, such a deadly life, in your denial, I would find no sense. I would not understand it. Why, what would you? Or rather, why, what would you do? Now, Viola says, well, here's what I would do. Okay, this is a woman, right, dressed as a boy. Here's how a woman wants to be wooed. Make me a willow cabin at your gate and call upon my soul within the house. Write loyal cantons of contemned love and sing them loud even in the dead of night. Hallow your name to the reverberate hills and make the babbling gossip of the air cry out, Olivia, oh, you should not rest between the elements of air and earth, but you should pity me. Well, what's that a description of? a guy in love, right? It's, what he, it's, a ro it's a romantic image. Here's what I would do if I loved you the way my master does. Boom, boom, boom. Write you poems, sing to you at night, not say goodbye, not leave you, not let you get away without pitying me, meaning falling for me in return. Probably also fantasizing because she's in love with Orsino. Yeah, love right, Orsino right. But as I said last week, she, she's, she can't reveal herself yet because he's so in love with her or her image. Um, but she's not lying to herself about it, which Olivia has been doing. So Olivia's response to this very moving romantic image, you might do much. Whoa, what is your parentage? <laughs> Key question, right? Um, I'll just remind you that Viola has said early on, um, uh, Orsino, when the captain says, where are we? We're in Illyria, Orsino is the Duke. Orsino, I've heard my father name him. He was a bachelor then. I've heard my father name him. Okay, there's a connection there. So that means, okay, that's an okay possible match. So she says, What's your what is your parentage? Viola, above my fortunes, yet my state is well. I am a gentleman. Get you to your Lord. I cannot love him. Let him send no more, unless perchance, notice, let him send no more, unless perchance you come to me again to tell me how he takes it. Fare you well. I thank you for your pains. Spend this for me tries to give her money. I am no feed post lady, keep your purse. My master, not myself, lacks recompense. Love make his heart of flint that you shall love, and let your fervor like my master's be placed in contempt. Farewell, fair cruelty. Well, what is she calling down upon Olivia? To fall in love with someone who doesn't fall in love with her. Guess what? <laughs> it's just what's happened. She doesn't know it yet. I mean, Viola doesn't know it yet. So then Viola goes out, Olivia, in verse, what is your parentage? Above my fortunes, yet my state is well. I am a gentleman. I'll be sworn thou art. You're, you're darn tootin', that's what that means. Thy tongue, thy face, thy limbs, actions, and spirit do give thee fivefold blazoned. Whoa, wait a minute, not so fast, not too fast, soft, soft. Unless the master were the man meaning the servant. How now? Even so quickly may one catch the plague. Methinks I feel this youth's perfections with an invisible and subtle stealth to creep in at my eyes. Well, let it be. So let it be might mean leave it alone, but it might also mean, well, let it creep in. 
you understand? It's a kind of double. She's, she's, in a minute, we'll see where, which of the two it is. Uh, So remember what I said, that the, 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 when Viola and Sebastian and Antonio come to Illyria, it's like an invasion. And now here's Viola talking to Olivia, and she has her qualities, um, tongue, face, limbs, action, spirit, mainly spirit, with an invisible and subtle stealth creep in at her eyes, and she's caught. Cupid might as well have shot his arrow and hit her in the heart. She calls Malvolio. Run after that same peevish messenger, the county's man. He left this ring behind him, would I or not? Now, he didn't leave a ring behind him, of course. Tell him I'll none of it. Desire him not to flatter with his lord, nor hold, up him, with, hold him up with hopes. So that, this is all made up fantasy. I mean, invention for Malvolio's sake. I'm not for him. If that the youth will come this way tomorrow, I'll give him reasons for it. Hurry up, hi thee, Malvolio. Catch this kid. I'm out of my will. Olivia, soliloquy, okay? This is, what is soliloquy? Remember, a soliloquy is an, a character speaking honestly to the audience, not hiding from us. There's no secrets kept from the audience in soliloquy. They may lie to each other on stage, and we have to be shown that that's what they're doing, but like Iago, let's say, in Othello, but when they talk to us, they're telling us what's true within their mind. And she says, I do, I know not what, and fear to find mine eye too great a flatterer for my mind. Fate, show thy force. Ourselves we do not owe, meaning own. What is decreed must be, and be this so, <laughs> meaning, and let this be so. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm not in control of this. Something else has taken me over. Well, good, let it be. Okay, so this is the moment when she is uh, wrenched out of her sentimentality by something real. But it isn't real, we know, in the sense that it's a girl, it's not a boy. And it's Viola, it's not anybody she could actually marry. But what moves her is the quality of the speech, the quality of the personality, the presence of this boy. And that sets her up perfectly for um, being happy when she finds out that this boy is really this boy's twin brother when, when Sebastian shows up later. Okay, but do you see how Shakespeare wields prose and verse to draw us into this kind of dramatic, deeper, serious moment of love from all the kind of bantering that went on before? All right. Um, let's go to Act Two, Scene Four, and read a little of the Duke and uh, Viola and get a hint about their relationship. And that, this scene starting in verse. And how does he begin the scene? Give me some music. <laughs> Sound familiar? That's how the play started. If music be the food of love, play on. Still, he's stuck. Give me some music. Now good morrow, friends. Now good Cesario. But that piece of song, that old and antique song we heard last night, Methought it did relieve my passion much, more than light airs and recollected terms of these most brisk and giddy paced times. I don't like the modern music. Give me the old sentimental stuff. Come, but one verse. Curio, he is not here, so please your lordship that should sing it. That's prose. Who was it? Festi, the jester, my lord, a fool that the lady Olivia's father took much delight in. He is about the house. Seek him out and play the tune the while. That's a verse. Come hither, boy, he says to Cesario, Viola. If ever thou shalt love, in the sweet pangs of it, remember me. For such as I am, all true lovers are. Unstayed and skittish in all motions else, save in the constant image of the creature that is beloved. 
Hadest thou like this tune? It gives the very echo to the seat where love is thrown. So she is feeling it too, right? Because here's Duke, thou dost speak masterly, my life upon it. Young though thou art, thine eye hath stayed upon some favor that it loves. Hath it not, boy? A little by your favor, which means, if you please, but favor means face. You've, your eyes have fallen on a face that you love. She says, a little by your favor, using the same word. What kind of woman is it of your complexion? So complexion, remember, doesn't just mean color of skin. It means the whole complex of qualities. Remember this from my, I don't know how many years I've been, you've been attending my lectures, 30 maybe. So all the four humors and all the four elements and uh, are mixed within a person. That's his or her complexion. And it reveals itself in skin, but not just in skin. So she's sort of like you. She's got your makeup. She is not worthy then. What years in faith? About your years, my lord. Too old by heaven. Let still, meaning always, the woman take an elder than herself. So wears she to him. So sways she level in her husband's heart. For boy, however, so that's what's actually happening here, right? Viola's younger than Orsino by a little. For boy, however we do praise ourselves, we men, our fancies are more giddy and unfirm, more longing, wavering, sooner lost and worn than women's are. women's are. Okay, so this is two things. There's truth in this. Women can be more constant than men, although it can be the opposite too, depending on which story we're reading. But about himself, it's absolutely true. Because we, we read Festy saying this. His mind's a very opal. He's nothing but changeable. And he's now proclaiming this. Except for the image of Olivia. Well, we'll see. Uh, I think it well, my lord. Then let thy love be younger than thyself, or thy affection cannot hold the bent. For women are as roses, whose fair flower being once displayed doth fall that very hour. So their beauty doesn't last. So... Get someone younger. And so they are, alas that they are so, to die even when they to perfection grow. Well, here she is, unable to connect with him in the way she wants to, and being told that her beauty's gonna fade. Oh, fellow, come, the song we had last night, mark it, Cesario, it is old and plain, the spinsters and the knitters in the sun, and the free maids that weave their thread with bones do use to chant it. It is silly sooth, silly truth, and dallies with the innocence of love like the old age. So then Festi sings, and here's the song. Come away, come away, death. And in sad Cyprus, that's a symbol of death. Let me be laid. Fly away, fly away, breath. I am slain by a fair, cruel maid. My shroud of white stuck all with you, oh, prepare, you grows in uh, the graveyards. My part of death, no one so true did share it. Not a flower, not a flower sweet on my black coffin, let there be strewn. Not a friend, not a friend, greet my poor corpse where my bones shall be thrown. A thousand, thousand sighs to save, lay me, oh, where sad true lover never find my grave to weep there. Because the poor sad true lover, if he did find my grave, would so weep himself to death. So let me be completely separated and alone. What is this? Now the melancholy God protect thee and the tailor makes thy doublet of changeable taffeta, says Festi, in prose. It's just romantic self-indulgent, self-pitying, you know, sappy, soppy old song. All right, then he turns to Cesario, chases everyone away. Once more, Cesario, line 78. Get thee to yon same sovereign cruelty. Cruel because she won't love him back. Tell her, my love, more noble, tell her, my love, more noble than the world, prizes not quantity of dirty lands. The parts that fortune hath bestowed upon her, tell her I hold as giddily as fortune. I don't love her because of her lands. 
I don't love her because of her wealth. But tis that miracle and queen of gems that nature pranks her in attracts my soul. I love her body, her physical beauty. I'm a true lover. That's what I love about her. But if she cannot love you, sir, I cannot be so answered. Sooth, but you must. Say that some lady, as perhaps there is, hath for your love as great a pang of heart as you have for Olivia. You cannot love her, you tell her so. Must she not then be answered? There's no woman's sides can bide the beating of so strong a passion as love doth give my heart. No woman's heart so big to hold so much, they lack retention. Alas, their love may be called appetite. Okay, this is the guy that's just proclaimed his true love of Olivia because she's beautiful. But their love, women's love, may be called appetite. No motion of the liver, meaning sexual desire, but the palate, that is the superficial taste, that suffers surfeit, cloyment, and revolt. You eat too much, you don't like it anymore. But mine, my what? My love is all as hungry as the sea and can digest as much. Make no compare between that love a woman can bear me and that I owe Olivia. Well, what do we think of this argument? Are we persuaded? Nope. Hot air, balderdash. I but I know, she says. She's not going to directly contradict him. I but I know. What dost thou know? Too well what love women to men may owe. That's a rhyme. No, no, oh. In faith they are as true of heart as we, we men. My father had a daughter loved a man. As it might be, perhaps, were I a woman, I should your lordship. Nudge, nudge to the audience, of course. And what's her history? A blank, my lord. She never told her love. But let concealment like a worm in the bud feed on her damask cheek. Does everybody know what damask is? What? Yes. So it's a fine cloth. It originally made in Damascus, but it's multicolored. And it's, it's uh, sewn and woven so that it has this kind of multicolored th uh, threads creating these patterns. Very expensive to make, very labor intensive. And why does she have a damask cheek? Because it's white and red, to both colors. She pined in thought, and with a green and yellow melancholy sat like patience on a monument, smiling at grief. Was not this love indeed? We men may say more, swear more, but indeed our shows are more than will. For still, meaning always, we prove much in our vows, but little in our love. We men are more changeable than women. She was constant. Duke, but died thy sister of her love, my boy? I am all the daughters of my father's house, and all the brothers too, which turns out not to be true, but she doesn't know it yet. And yet I know not. I don't know if I'm going to die of this love. I'm leaving it to time, we'll see. <laughs> Sir, shall I to this lady? Aye, that's the theme. To her in haste, give her this jewel. Say, my love can give no place by no denay. denial. All right, so there's, there's the, the trap that she's in, dressed up as a boy. Now she's suddenly fallen in love with him and she can't say anything about it. Not because she can't change her disguise and but because he's not in love with her yet, and he thinks he's in love with Olivia. So she's got nothing to, to look for from him at the moment. Um, okay. <clears throat> Let's go to Malvolio. Uh, wait, did I read 3-1? Uh, 
no, let's, let's go to 3-1 first, and then we'll look at Malvolio. So she comes back, Viola as Cesario comes back to Olivia the next day. And I want to read a little of this, starting at, let's say, line about 90. My duty, madam, and most humble service. What is your name, says Olivia? Cesario is your servant's name, fair princess. My servant, sir, t'was never merry world since lowly feigning was called compliment. Your servant to the Count Orsino, youth. Don't lie to me. You're not my servant. Viola, and he is yours and his must needs be yours. Your servant's servant is your servant, madam. For him, I think not on him. For his thoughts, would they were blanks rather than filled with me. Madam, I come to whet your gentle thoughts on his behalf. Oh, by your leave, I pray you, meaning uh, no more of that. <laughs> I bade you never speak again of him. But would you undertake another suit? I had rather hear you to solicit that than music from the spheres. Music from the spheres, right, means the sound that the perfect, of perfect harmony that the angels are in charge of in the movement of the spheres, which human beings can't hear. Why? Because we're fallen. We're below the level of the changeable moon. And therefore, it's, we're blocked from the joy of the harmonies of heaven. But I would rather hear you make this suit than the music from the spheres. Dear lady, give me leave, beseech you. I did send after the last enchantment you did hear a ring in chase of you. So did I abuse myself, my servant, and I fear me, you. In other words, I said it was from your Lord and I was sending it back, but it was really from me to you. Under your hard construction must I sit to force that on you in a shameful cunning which you knew none of yours. What might you think? Have you not set mine honor at the stake and baited it with all the unmuzzled thoughts that tyrannous heart can think? The metaphor is from bear baiting. They would tie a bear, do you know this? They would tie a bear to a stake in the middle of a theater uh, and set mastiff, bull mastiff dogs to attack the bear and they'd bet on whether the dogs would kill the bear before the bear killed the dogs, or vice versa. Unmuzzled. To one of your receiving enough is shown, a cypress that is see-through, not a bosom hides my heart, so let me hear you speak. I pity you. That's a degree to love. She's now filling out that iambic line from Viola. It was the other way yesterday, now it's this way. Viola, no, not agrees, for tis a vulgar proof that very oft we pity enemies. Why then, enemies, okay. So she's implying you're my enemy, I can't love you. Why then, methinks tis time to smile again. Okay, like today the word would be whatever. O oh world, how apt the poor are to be proud. If one should be a prey, how much the better to fall before the lion than the wolf. The clock strikes, clock upbraids me with the waste of time. Be not afraid, good youth, I will not have you, she says. And yet, when wit in youth is come to harvest, your wife is like to reap a proper man. There lies your way, due west. Then westward ho, grace and good disposition attend your ladyship. You'll nothing, madam, to my lord by me? And it's, she can't stand it anymore. Stay. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Right? It's an iambic pentameter line of one syllable and the rest empty feet. I prithee, tell me what thou thinkst of me. Now, an actor could put that stay at the end of that iambic line. So, um, you'll nothing, madam, by my lord to me? Uh, sorry, you're, you'll nothing, madam, to my lord by me? Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba stay. I prithee, tell me what thou thinkst of me. That you do think you are not what you are. You think you're not mortal. You think your beauty won't fade. Olivia, if I think so, I think the same of you. I think you're not what you are. Viola, then you think right, I am not what I am. I would you were as I would have you be. Would it be better, madam, than I am? I wish it might, for now I am your fool. You're making a fool of me. 
Oh, what a deal of scorn looks beautiful in the contempt and anger of his lip. A murderous guilt shows not itself more soon than love that would seem hid. Love's night is noon. I think those four lines are an aside. It doesn't say so in the text, but she uses the third person. And I think she's saying that to herself and saying, I can't hide it anymore. Because then she jumps in and says, Cesario, by the roses of the spring, by maidhood, honor, truth, and everything, I love thee so, that maugre all thy pride, nor wit nor reason can my passion hide. You seem to be proud, too proud to love me, but I don't care, I can't help it, I have to tell you I love you. Do not extort thy reasons from this clause, for that I woo, thou therefore hast no cause. Don't think because I'm wooing you, you shouldn't woo me, but rather reason thus with reason fetter. Love sought is good, but given unsought is better. So therefore you should be happy that I'm declaring this love to you. Viola. What's she going to do? She's got to take a stand here. I mean, the poor woman. By innocence I swear, and by my youth, I have one heart, one bosom, and one truth, and that no woman has. Nor never none shall mistress be of it, save I alone. Of course, there's going to be a master of it, but she's not giving that away. And so would you, good madam. Nevermore will I my master's tears to you deplore. Olivia, yet come again, for thou perhaps mayst move the, that heart which now abhors to like his love. Okay, okay, come and try me again. Maybe you'll convince me to love him. <laughs> Desperate. Okay, questions about what we've read so far. Everything clear? Pretty clear. Okay. Um, Malvolio. So we'll just give a little of him. I read the other night, uh, seven of my people with an obedient start make out for him when he's fantasizing. We didn't read the MOAI part. Um, so let's read a little bit of the letter from uh, ostensibly from Olivia, but really from Mariah. Okay, there's a very dirty joke here, which I'm going to um, resist explaining, but I'll just point out to you that when he says, these be her very C's, her U's, and her T's, <coughs> and thus she makes she, thus makes she her great P's, it is a foul, or, or at least risque sexual allu allusion. <coughs> and Andrew doesn't get it. <laughs> and he repeats it, so the audience does. Her C's, her U's, and her T's, why that? To the unknown beloved, this and my good wishes. Her very phrases. So he opens the wax, and it's an image of Lucrece. Lucrece was a heroine of ancient Rome that Shakespeare had written a long poem about who was raped by Tarquin <clears throat> forcibly uh, under threat that he would tell her husband that she had been raped and would kill a servant and throw him on her bed to prove it, to prove that she was unfaithful. She didn't want to be thought unfaithful. So she submitted to him and then she went to her husband the next day when he came back and confessed everything and killed herself to preserve her honor. So this is the Lucrece chastity, image of virtue that uh, Olivia seals her letters with. Where are we right now? We're in Act 5, uh, sorry, Act 2, Scene 5, line about 86 or 88. Malvolio is reading the letter. Jove knows I love, this is dimeters, right? Two feet per line. But who, that's a monometer, lips do not move, no man must know. Dimeters again. No man must know. What follows? The number is altered. No man must know. If this should be the Malvolio. Right? He jumps to this conclusion, just as Mariah knew he would. I may command where I adore, but silence like a Lucrece knife, with bloodless stroke my heart doth gore, M-O-A-I doth sway my life. Now, Fabian tells us what we're supposed to think of this. I can't tell you how many 
<laughs> readers have gone looking for what Shakespeare secretly means by these four letters. M-O-A-I, oh, he's gotta be sending us a message. Fabian tells us what the message is. It's a fustian riddle. It's empty, it's fake, it's hot air. There's nothing there except the, the hint that Malvolio is going to take. M-O-A-I doth sway my life. Nay, but first, let me see, let me see, let me see. I may command where I adore. Why, she may command me, I serve her, she is my lady. Why, this is evident to any formal capacity that is anybody capable of reasoning. There is no obstruction in this, and the end. What should that alphabetical position portend? If I could make that resemble something in me. Now look what he says. If I could make that resemble something in me. This is exactly what I meant by sentimentality. It's not, what does this mean? Oh, it resembles me. Like it does resemble me and I'm discovering it. No, if I could make it resemble something in me. That's the willfulness. Softly, M-O-A-I. Toby says, uh, echoing him, O-I, M-O-A-I, O-I, make that up that. M, M, mm, Malvolio, M, mm, why, that begins my name. M, but then there is no consonancy in the sequel that suffers under privation. By the way, in your text, after sequel, it should not be a period in a capital, it's just uh, it's one sentence. A should follow, but O does. And O oh, shall end, I hope. I or I'll cudgel and make him cry, O. Oh. Uh, and then I comes behind. Yeah, if you had an I behind you. M-O-A-I, this simulation is not as the former, and yet to crush this a little, it would bow to me, for every one of these letters are in my name. Soft, here follows prose. And then I, I won't read the whole letter, but remember the part where it says, <clears throat> yellow stockings cross guarded and some are born great some achieve greatness and some have greatness thrust upon them and he falls hook line and sinker for the seduction for the temptation okay now in act three scene four he comes to her in yellow stockings and cross guarded Mariah comes in first and says he does nothing. He's mad. He does nothing but smile. He's possessed. <laughs> Why do people go mad at this time? There are a few reasons. Thwarted in love, thwarted in ambition, and possessed by a demon. And there are a few other reasons. But possessed by the demon, a demon is one of the common ones. And it's right got authority of the New Testament, right? When Jesus chases the the swine off the cliff and the demons out of the people. Your ladyship were best have some guard about you if he come, for sure the man is tainted in his wits. I'm in act three, scene four, line 10 or so. Go call him hither. I am as mad as he, if sad and merry madness equal be. So he's in merry madness and I'm in, he's smile, smile, smile. And I'm in sad madness because of love, thwarted love. How now, Malvolio? Sweet lady, ho, ho. Smilest thou? I sent for thee upon a sad occasion. Sad, lady? I could be sad. This does make some obstruction in the blood, this cross gartering. But what of that? If it please the eye of one, it is with me, as the very true sonnet is, please one and please all. What are you talking about? How dost thou, man? What is the matter with me? Not black in my mind, though yellow in my legs. It did come to his hands, and commands shall be executed. I think we do know the sweet Roman hand. Now, Mariah has written the letter, but she can imitate Olivia's handwriting. So he thinks it's hers. Wilt thou go to bed, Malvolio, to recover? Malvolio, to bed? Aye, sweetheart, and I'll come to thee. What? God comfort thee. Why dost thou smile so and kiss thy hand so oft? And Mariah says, how do you, Malvolio? And he says, at your request? Yes, Nightingale's answer, Dawes. 
This is what a daw sounds like. So he was told in the letter to be surly with the servants. And so now he's being surly with the servants. <laughs> All right, this goes on. Some, achieve, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. Olivia doesn't know what's going on. She sends him, meaning Toby, on purpose that I may appear stubborn to him, line 62, for she incites me to that in the letter. Cast thy humble slough, says she. Be opposite with kinsmen, surly with servants, etc. So everything goes according to the letter. All right. They treat him as if he's mad, and they're going to uh, put him in a dark house, which is what you tr do to madmen. Put him in the dark so they're not stimulated and let them recover, presumably. <laughs> I want to read uh, Sir Andrew Ague Cheek's letter of challenge. Remember that he's decided to challenge Cesario to a duel because Cesario has stepped in and gotten Olivia's attention away from him. And he imagines he's going to win her over somehow. Here's the challenge. Read it. I warrant there's vinegar and pepper in it. That's Act 3, Scene 4, line 135. Is it so saucy? I is, I warrant him, do but read. <clears throat> Toby, give me. Youth, whatsoever thou art, thou art but a scurvy fellow. Good and valiant, Toby. Wonder not, nor admire not in thy mind why I do call thee so, for I will show thee no reason for it. A good note that keeps you from the blow of the law. Thou comest to the Lady Olivia, and in my sight she uses thee kindly. But thou liest in thy throat. That is not the matter I challenge thee for. <laughs> this is funny at so many levels. Okay, he's ostensibly challenging him because Olivia is kind to somebody, which everybody should be to everybody, right? But then he says, even though he's told him that that's what he, is on his mind, he calls him a liar, although he hasn't said anything because he hasn't read it yet. And that is not the matter that I challenge thee for. Very brief and to exceeding good sense less. I will way they, waylay thee going home, where it be, if it be thy chance to kill me, I'm going to waylay you, and we're going to fight. And if you kill me, thou killst me like a rogue and a villain. Fare thee well, and God have mercy on one of our souls. Because <laughs> one of us is going to die. He may have mercy upon mine, that is, if I die, but my hope is better. <laughs> I hope he doesn't have mercy on my soul. And so look to thyself. Thy friend as thou usest him, and thy, sworn, thy friend and thy sworn enemy, Andrew Aguchi. So Toby says at line 171, after Andrew goes out, now will I not deliver this letter, for the behavior of the young gentleman gives him out to be of good capacity and breeding, I meaning he's smart and he's well-bred. His employment between his lord and my niece confirms no less. Therefore, this letter, being so excellently ignorant, will breed no terror in the youth. He'll find it comes from a clodpole. But, sir, I will deliver his challenge by word of mouth, set upon Aguchik a notable report of valor. And again, disguise, right? Making it all up and drive the gentleman, as I know his youth will aptly receive it, into a most hideous opinion of his rage, skill, fury, and impetuosity. This will so fright them both that they will kill one another by the look, like cockatrices. He means basilisks, who kill by just looking at something. Well, that's more or less what happens. They don't kill each other, but they, they basically are terrorized about each other. And when they meet, and and Viola Cesario is persuaded to take one pass with him, just for Andrew's honor's sake. Each one is told that the other is a demonic, wild fencer and murderous. So as they're just pretending to fight, in comes Antonio and says at line about 290, put up your sword. If this young gentleman have done offense, I take the fault on me. 
If you offend him, I for him defy you. And then we have this exchange with Antonio, which is just terrifying to me. Remember that he and Sebastian have separated. He's given Sebastian his purse and said, meet me at the elephant, which is the inn at the sign of the elephant. And Sebastian says, why are you giving me your money? Because maybe you'll want some to buy something in town, you know. It's okay. I trust you. We'll meet again and, uh, and it'll be fine. So Sebastian says, okay, and disappears. And now here's what he thinks is Sebastian. He's arrested because the officers know that this, he's been fighting Orsino in the past at sea. And he turns to Cesario, thinking it's Sebastian, and says, this comes with seeking you. But there's no remedy. I shall answer it. Don't worry. Don't worry about me. What will you do now my necessity makes me to ask you for my purse? It grieves me much more for what I cannot do for you than what befalls myself. You stand amazed, but be of comfort. I must entreat of you some of that money. What money, sir? Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Or it might be, I must entreat of you some of that money. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. What money, sir? I think that's how I'd do it. For the fair kindness you have showed me here, and in part being prompted by your present trouble, out of my lean and low ability, I'll lend you something. My having is not much. I'll make division of my present with you. Everything I have, I'll give you half. Hold, there's half my coffer. Will you deny me now? Is it possible that my deserts to you can lack persuasion? Do not tempt my misery, lest that it make me so unsound a man as to upbraid you with those kindnesses that I have done for you. I know of none, nor know I you by voice or any feature. I hate ingratitude more in a man than lying, vainness, babbling, drunkenness, or any taint of vice whose strong corruption inhabits our frail blood. Uh, look at that list, by the way. Sound familiar? Lying. Had a powerful variety of that. Vainness, well, Orsino in his vainness, uh, Olivia in her vainness, Sir Toby in hers, Sir Andrew certainly in hers, and above all, Malvolio in his. Babbling, that's Sir Andrew for sure. And drunkenness, that's Sir Toby, or taint of any vice whose strong corruption inhabits our frail blood. Oh, heavens themselves! Let me speak a little, says Antonio. This youth that you see here, I snatched one half out of the jaws of death, relieved him with such sanctity of love, and to his image, which methought did promise most venerable worth, did I devotion. What's that to us? The time goes by, says the officer, away. But oh, how vile and idle proves this God. Thou hast, Sebastian, done good feature shame. In nature, there's no blemish but the mind. None can be called deformed but the unkind. Virtue is beauty, but the beauteous evil are empty trunks or flourished by the devil. The inside, the outside, the fake beauty, the true beauty. The true beauty is virtue. This is pure Aristotle. Imagine the pain of this. Lead me on. Now Viola has gotten a hint of something. Methinks his words do so, from such passion fly that he believes himself. So do not I. I can't believe. I've never seen him before. Prove true imagination. Oh, prove true that I, dear brother, be now ta'en for you. And he is. He named Sebastian, she says. I, my brother, know yet living in my glass, my mirror. Even such and so in favor was my brother, and he went still always in this fashion. Color, ornament, for him I imitate. Oh, if it prove, tempests are kind, and salt waves fresh in love.
And then the next scene, Festi goes, thinking it's Cesario talking to Sebastian. And Sebastian says, what are you talking about? I never saw you before. I am not I. So in comes Sir Andrew, thinking he's fight <laughs> fighting the coward Cesario, and he meets Sebastian, and blam, he gets whacked. And then Toby steps in and says, well, then fight me. And Olivia comes and stops them. And now we get Olivia and Sebastian. She yells at Toby, ungracious wretch. Be not offended, dear Cesario. Rudes be gone. She chases them out. I prithee, gentle friend. Let thy... F now, remember Sebastian, okay? His, he's left everything. His only living relative is drowned at sea. He comes ashore with nothing, saved by Antonio. And he's got no, no prospects. He's carrying Antonio's purse around just to see the town. And all of a sudden, this gorgeous countess looks at him and says, I pray thee, gentle friend, let thy fair wisdom, not thy passion, sway in this uncivil and unjust extent against thy peace. Don't be upset by this Sir Toby behavior. Go with me to my house and hear you, and hear thou there how many fruitless pranks this ruffian hath botched up, that thou thereby mayest smile at this. Thou shalt not choose but go, do not deny. Beshrew his soul for me. He started, meaning startled, one poor heart of mine in thee. In, in fighting you, he startled my heart. Whoops, I hit the, sorry. Sebastian, what relish is in this? How runs the stream? Or I am mad or else this is a dream. Let fancy still, meaning always, my sense in Lethe steep. If it be thus to dream, still let me sleep. So what's he doing right there? OK, you want me to come with you? Fine, you're beautiful. You're obviously in control of stuff. Sure, got nothing else to do today or for the rest of my life. In other words, like Viola, he is accepting what's happening. He sees it and he doesn't understand it, but he welcomes it. Nay, come, I prithee, would thou be ruled by me? Madam, I will, says he. Oh, say so and so be. Suddenly she's thrilled because he's caved, right? He's come around. He's following her. Okay. They torment Malvolio in the dark house. Um, Festi pretends to be Sir Topaz, the curate. And he has a hilarious lot of fustian, imitation talk. But it's all uh, directed at Malvolio being possessed by a devil to punish him for his pride and sentimentality. And then we get Sebastian again. So he's been in the house with Olivia and he comes out and he's got a soliloquy. Here you can see an example of variation. He's saying the same thing several times. Uh, see if you follow, and then you, if you have questions, we'll look at it closer. This is the air. That is the glorious sun. Now, how do I know what a hit is? It's not this is the air. That is the glorious. It's iambic. This is the air. That is the glorious sun. It's not not those things. Reality is still reality. This pearl she gave me, I do feel it and see it. And though tis wonder that enwraps me thus, yet tis not madness. Where's Antonio then? I could not find him at the elephant, yet there he was, meaning he had been there. And there I found his credit that he did range the town to seek me out. Now we know he's been arrested. His counsel now might do me golden service. For though my soul disputes well with my sense that this may be some error, but no madness, 
that is my senses that it's madness, but my soul is disputing with it that it isn't madness. Yet doth this accident and flood of fortune so far exceed all instance, all discourse, that I am ready to distrust mine eyes and wrangle with my reason that persuades me to any other trust, but that I am mad, or else the lady's mad. Yet if twere so, she could not sway her house, command her followers, take and give back affairs and their dispatch with such a smooth, discreet, and stable bearing as I perceive she does. There's something in it that is deceivable. But here the lady comes. So what's the speech saying? Am I mad or not? That's all it is. Or is she mad? So she comes in and, with a priest. Blame not this haste of mine. If you mean well, now go with me and with this holy man into the chantry by. There before him and underneath that consecrated roof, plight me the full assurance of your faith that my most jealous, meaning suspicious, and too doubtful soul may live at peace. You, you seem changeable, like you were against me and now you want to marry me, so let's marry and then I'll be sure of you. He shall conceal it whilst you are willing it shall come to note. Until, meaning whiles means until there. What time we will our celebration keep according to my birth? When you are willing to announce it, then we'll celebrate according to my birth. Like I'm a countess, right? We're going to have a great big wedding festival. What do you say? I'll follow this good man and go with you. And having sworn truth ever will be true. He could do a lot worse, right? <laughs> She's a countess. He's got nothing. <laughs> then lead the way, good father, and heaven so shine that they may fairly note this act of mine. Heavens so shine. So she's grabbed the right uh, twin for a change. And he's in. He's in. Okay, um, maybe we'll take a two, three minute break and then we'll read Act 5, Scene 1, the end of the play, and then um, I'll sum up with a couple of general things. So let's absolve Antonio of being a pirate. The Duke re remembers him, we're in Act 5, Scene 1 now, and, which is long, it's, the, uh, it's one scene for the whole uh, act. Are we running? Okay. Um, the Duke remembers him, though he was besmeared at the time they were having a sea battle. This is that Antonio that took the phoenix and her fraught from candy, and this is he that did the tiger board when your young nephew Titus lost his leg. And Viola says about him, he did me kindness, sir, drew on my side, drew his sword on my side, but in conclusion put strange speech upon me. I know not what twas but distraction, meaning madness. Like Malvolio, locked in a dark room, <laughs> being mad. Notable pirate, says the Duke, thou salt water thief. What foolish boldness brought thee to their mercies, whom thou in terms so bloody and so dear hast made thine enemies. Or see no noble, sir. Be pleased that I shake off these names you give me. Antonio never yet was thief or pirate. That's what we want to hear about this friend of Sebastian, right? Though I confess on base and ground enough for Sino's enemy, I was fighting for my city, you were fighting for your city, they were at war, what was I supposed to do? Of course I was going to fight. But why did I come here? A witchcraft drew me hither. That most ingrateful boy there by your side, from the rude seas enraged and foamy mouth, did I redeem. A rack past hope he was. His life I gave him, and did thereto add my love without retention or restraint, all his in dedication. For his sake did I expose myself, pure for his love, into the danger of this adverse town, drew to defend him when he was beset, where being apprehended, his false cunning, not meaning to partake with me in danger, that is, I guess it's because he didn't want to get arrested and be associated with me. I don't know the guy. 
taught him to face me out of his acquaintance and grew a 20 years removed thing while one would wink. Denied me mine own purse, which I had recommended to his use not half an hour before. Viola, how can this be? When came he to this town? Today, my lord, and for three months before, no interim, not a minute's vacancy, both day and night did we keep company. And then it doesn't get explained, because in comes Olivia. So everything's being interrupted and nothing's getting resolved. Shakespeare builds and builds and builds the tension. Here comes the countess. Now heaven walks on earth. But for thee, fellow, fellow, thy words are madness. Three months this youth hath tended upon me. But more of that anon. Take him aside. Olivia, to the duke. What would my lord but that he may not have, wherein Olivia may seem serviceable? How can I serve you? Now, he is her superior, duke, and she's a countess, right? I want to serve you. I want to give you everything but what you want, namely myself. Then she looks at <coughs> Viola Cesaria. Cesaria, do not keep promise with me. Madam? Duke, gracious Olivia, what do you say, Cesario? Good, my lord. So she is talking to Cesario and she's putting aside the duke. This is not what we call decorum, right? Viola can't believe what she's seeing. My lord would speak, my duty hushes me. He wants to talk to you and you're looking, asking me to talk to you. If it be aught to the old tune, my lord, it is as fat and fulsome to mine ear as howling after music. Still so cruel, still so constant, Lord. What, to perverseness? You uncivil lady, to whose ingrate and unauspicious altars my soul the faithfulest offerings have breathed out that e'er devotion tendered. What shall I do? Now, uh, his certainty about his unchanging and absolute love suddenly turns to name calling, right? He's attacking her. You uncivil lady, you're ungrateful, you're unauspicious. What shall, what shall I do? Even that, it, even what it please my Lord that shall become him, whatever is becoming to you, whatever is appropriate. Now, look what he says. And this is the downside of sentimentality. This is the risk and the danger. Why should I not, had I the heart to do it, like to the Egyptian thief at point of death, kill what I love? a savage jealousy that sometimes savors nobly. Why shouldn't I kill you? But hear me this, since you to non-regardance cast my faith, and that I partly know the instrument that screws me from my true place in your favor, live you the marble-breasted tyrant still? But this your minion, <clears throat> whom I know you love, and whom, by heaven I swear, I tender dearly, him will I tear out of that cruel eye where he sits crowned in his master's spite. Come, boy, with me. My thoughts are ripe in mischief. I'll sacrifice the lamb that I do love to spite a raven's heart within a dove. Olivia's the dove. But she's got a raven's heart because she won't love him, but she loves Cesario. So, to spite her, I'm going to kill Cesario. He's sounding like a tyrant, a full on tyrant here. And Viola says, And I, most jock and apt and willingly to do you rest, a thousand deaths would die. Where goes Cesario? After him I love. More than I love these eyes, more than my life. More by all mores than e'er I shall love wife. If I do feign you witnesses above, punish my life for tainting of my love. She's told her true love, even though it's a boy. I mean, dressed as a boy. This is devotion. This would be, if she were a boy, what Antonio has felt about Sebastian. But she's not, and we know it. Olivia, I, me detested, how am I beguiled? Because she thought she just married this guy who said he'd obey her, and now all of a sudden, he's turning against her. Who does beguile you? Who does, you, does do you wrong? Hast thou forgot thyself? Is it so long? Call forth the Holy Father. Come away. 
Whither, my lord? Cesario, husband, stay. Boom. Husband? Aye, husband, can he that deny? Her husband, Sira? Now the duke's really pissed off. No, my lord, not I. Alas, it is the baseness of thy fear that makes thee strangle thy propriety. Fear not, Cesario, take, up, take thy fortunes up. Be that thou knowest thou art, and then thou art as great as that thou fearest. If you're the husband of a countess, you don't have to live in so much fear of a, of a duke. So the priest comes in. Tell me what's just passed between us, a contract of eternal bond of love, etc., etc., two hours ago. Oh, says the duke, thou dissembling cub, what wilt thou be when time hath sowed a grizzle on thy case? Turned you gray on the outside. Now hold the place. And go back to Act 1, Scene 1, Line 36. When he's mooning in music about Olivia, he says at line 36, or at line 34, oh, she that hath the heart of that fine frame to pay this debt of love but to a brother, meaning Olivia, how will she love when the rich golden shaft hath killed the flock of all affections else that live in her? When liver, brain, and heart, these sovereign thrones are all supplied and filled her sweet perfections with one self king. What's she gonna be like? If she's so devoted to a brother, how devoted is she gonna be to me eventually? Or to her husband? So he's predicting a future based on his own kind of fancy and based on hers. And now he says, predicting the future of Cesario, oh thou dissembling cub, what wilt thou be when time is so to grizzle on your case? If you're this bad now, or will not else thy craft so quickly grow that thine own trip shall be thine overthrow? You're gonna ruin yourself because you're such a betrayer. Farewell and take her, but direct thy feet where thou and I henceforth may never meet. You're out of my life. Go. My lord, I do protest. Olivia, oh, do not swear. Hold little faith, though thou hast too much fear. Keep faith with me. Enter Sir Andrew. For the love of God, a surgeon. <laughs> Why? Because Sebastian's beaten him, right? What's the matter? He has broke my head across and given Sir Toby a bloody coxcomb, too. For the love of God, your help. I had rather than 40 pounds I wear at home. <laughs> Who has done this? The Count's gentleman won Cesario. We took him for a coward, but he's a very devil incarnate, which is a malaprop. Here he is, says Andrew. You broke my head for nothing, and that that I did, I was set on to do it by Sir Toby. Why do you speak to me? I never hurt you. You drew your sword upon me without cause, but I bespake you fair and hurt you not. If a bloody coxcomb be a hurt, you have hurt me. I think you said nothing by a bloody coxcomb. Here comes Sir Toby halting, that is limping. All right, so <laughs> it's particularly hilarious that Toby says, how is it with you? That's all one, it doesn't matter. He has hurt me and there's an end on it. Sot, he says to Festy, meaning drunkard. Did see Dick Surgeon sot? Festy says, oh, he's drunk, Sir Toby, an hour agone. His eyes were set at eight in the morning. I need a doctor, my head hurts. Oh, the doctor? Sorry, he's drunk, can't help you. In other words, the whirly gig of time bringing in its revenges, because Toby's been the drunk. Toby hates him, then he's a rogue and a pass he measures paven. I hate a drunken rogue. <laughs> I hate a drunken rogue. And then Andrew says, I'll help you, Sir Toby, because we'll be dressed together. And Toby finally has it with Sir Andrew. Will you help an asshead and a coxcomb and a knave, a thin-faced knave, a gull? Out they go. So he's turned against Sir Andrew finally. Now we don't know if they make it up ever or Andrew learns from this. He's just out of the picture. But Sebastian suddenly enters. I'm sorry, madam, I have hurt your kinsman, but had it been the brother of my blood, I must have done no less with wit and safety. In other words, if I had my wits and I were protecting my life, I had to do it. 
You throw a strange regard upon me, and by that I do perceive it hath offended you. Pardon me, sweet one, even for the vows we made each other but so late ago. We just got married, so pardon me. And they're going. <laughs> one face, one voice, one habit, and two persons. A natural perspective that is and is not. And then he sees Antonio. Antonio! Oh, I'm going to weep. Oh, my dear Antonio, how have the hours racked and tortured me since I have lost thee? Sebastian, are you? Fearst thou that, Antonio? How have you made division of yourself? An apple cleft in two is not more twin than these two creatures. Which is Sebastian, Olivia? Most wonderful. Now, every audience in our time is milked for, oh boy, Olivia gets two boys instead of one. How exciting. Nonsense. By wonderful, she means amazing, wondrous, astonishing. Of course, there's this undercurrent of, it's pretty wonderful because she was in love with the one and here's the other, and, but there are two of them. Do I stand there, says Sebastian? I never had a brother, nor can there be that deity in my nature of here and everywhere. I'm not like a god that I could be here and everywhere at once. I had a sister whom the blind waves and surges have devoured. Of charity, what kin are you to me? What countryman, what name, what parentage? How is it that you come upon somebody that looks exactly like you? A boy. Of Messaline. So they build together. And you are a spirit come to fright us, because I thought you were dead. A spirit I am indeed, says Sebastian, but I am in that dimension grossly clad, which from the womb I did participate, meaning the body. I've got a living body. I'm a spirit, but I'm in a body. Were you a woman, as the rest goes even, I should my tears let fall upon your cheek and say, thrice welcome drowned Viola. And then we get the classic recognition information. My father had a mole upon his brow, so had mine. He died the day that Viola from her birth had numbered 13 years. Yep. If nothing lets, meaning like a let ball in tennis, right? Prevents, obstructs, to make us happy both, but this my masculine usurped attire. Do not embrace me till each circumstance of place, time, fortune do can hear and jump, meaning come together that I am Viola. Which to confirm, I'll bring you to a captain in this town where lie my maiden weeds. He's got my girl's clothes. By whose gentle help I was preser preserved to serve this noble count. All the occurrence of my fortune since hath been between this lady and this lord. Sebastian, to his wife now, the countess. So comes it, lady, you have been mistook. But nature to her bias drew in that. You would have been contracted to a maid. Nor are you therein by my life deceived. You are betrothed both to a maid and man. Meaning I am also a virgin. I am not a, you know, sleaze bucket. I don't, uh, I don't go around. I'm young and pure and your husband. So that the mistake is on the surface. The reality is true. Nature to her bias drew in that. So we've had time, we've had love, we've had nature, we've had these abstractions who are ordering things against the false and sentimental wills of the people who are trying to disorder things and drawing them to her bias, drawing them to her direction. Bias is a, a word from... Um, Law, uh, uh, old Renaissance bowling. Um, you would bowl at pins on the grass, and the, the ball had a, uh, was um, unevenly weighted, uh, weighted on one side. So you would roll it, and it would, it would roll at an angle, you know, like a curveball in baseball. Um, and that was called its bias. So you had to plan on that. Like if you were good at it, you would know how, what the bias was and what the lay of the land was. Sort of like a golfer looking at the grass and then 
a bowler, you know, twisting his hand, and so on. So nature, to her bias, drew in that. It, nature's organizing this in a way that we uh, uh, are uh, patient to or victims of. We can accept that humbly or we can resist it by willfulness. Duke, be not amazed. Right noble is his blood. If this be so, so he knows he's noble because he knows who Cesario is. <clears throat> if this be so, as yet the glass seems true, I shall have share in this most happy rack. Boy, thou hast said to me a thousand times thou never shouldst love woman like to me. So we've only heard one of those times, and a thousand just means a lot. But basically, Cesario said, I'm totally devoted to you. I'll never love a woman the way I love you. And she says, and all those sayings will I overswear, meaning swear again, and all those swearings keep as true in soul as doth that orbid continent the fire that severs day from night. True as the sun moving around the earth. Give me thy hand and let me see thee in my woman's weeds. I want to see you in your girl's clothes. The captain that did bring me first on shore hath my maid's garments. He upon some action is now endurance at Malvolio's suit. Aha, we don't know anything about this. This is just thrown in at the end. Malvolio got this captain arrested for some stupid reason. Stupid Malvolio-like reason. Bad will. A gentleman and follower of my ladies. He shall enlarge him, says Olivia. Fetch Malvolio. Oh, wait a minute, I forgot. He's crazy. So now we bring in Malvolio. Now before he comes in, uh, the clown's going to read Malvolio's letter. <laughs> oh, this is so hilarious on the stage. He says, um, he has here writ a letter to you, Festi says. I should have given it to you this today morning, but as a madman's epistles are no gospels, so it skills not much when they are delivered. Open it and read it. The clown, I mean, uh, Festi. Look then to be well edified when the fool delivers the madman. He picks up the letter and he goes, By the Lord, madam! And Olivia says, How now? Art thou mad? And Festy says, No, madam, I do but read madness. And your ladyship will have it as it ought to be. You must allow vox, meaning voice. Prithee, read of thy right wits. So I do, Madonna, but to read his right wits is to read thus, therefore prepend, my mistress, and give ear. So he's about to shout again. And she says, you read it to Fabian. Here's his letter. By the Lord, madam, you wrong me, and the world shall know it. Though you have put me into darkness and given your drunken cousin rule over me, yet have I the benefit of my senses as well as your ladyship. I have your own letter that induced me to the semblance I put on, with the which I doubt not but to do myself much right or you much shame. Think of me as you please. I leave my duty a little unthought of and speak out of my injury, the madly used Malvolio. In other words, he signs the letter not with the normal, formal salutation, but did he write this? I, madam. Doesn't sound mad. So. One day shall crown the alliance, so please you here at my house and at my proper cost. She's going to pay for both weddings, and they're going to be married on the same day, or celebrate their marriage on the same day. <clears throat> Duke says, Madam, I am most apt to embrace your offer. Okay, that's nice of you, good. Your master, Tavila, quits you. That is, I'm relieving you of duty. And for your service done him, so much against the metal of your sex, so far beneath your soft and tender breeding. And since you called me master for so long, here is my hand. You shall from this time be your master's mistress. Olivia says to Cesario, Viola, a sister, you are she. Now we're going to be related, right? Because I'm marrying your brother. Enter Malvolio. Madam, you have done me wrong, notorious wrong. Have I, Malvolio? No. Lady, you have. Pray you peruse this letter. And then he repeats the whole story. Kept in a dark house, made the most notorious geck and gull that air invention played on. Tell me why. Alas, Malvolio, this is not my writing. Though I confess much like the character, but out of question tis Mariah's hand. And now I do bethink me, it was she first told me you were mad, thou wast mad. 
thou camest in smiling and in such forms which, were, which here were presupposed upon thee in the letter. Prithee be content. This practice, meaning this trick, this plot, hath most shrewdly passed upon thee. But when we know the grounds and authors of it, thou shalt be both the plaintiff and the judge of thine own cause. You're going to plead your cause and you're going to judge your cause. Fabian says, whoa, that's scary. Wait a minute. Good madam, hear me speak. And let no quarrel, no, no brawl to come to taint the condition of this present hour, meaning the wedding happiness, which I have wondered at. In hope it shall not. Most freely I confess myself, and Toby set this device against Malvolio here, upon some stubborn and uncourteous parts we had conceived against him. Mariah writ the letter at Sir Toby's great importance, meaning he importuned, importuned her to write the letter, in recompense whereof he hath married her. Finally! How with a sportful malice it was followed may rather pluck on laughter than revenge, if that the injuries be justly weighed that have on both sides passed. If you measure what Malvolio did to us, how he treated us, Alas, poor fool, how they have baffled thee. And then Festy speaks up. Did I read this the other day? I think I did. Why, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrown upon them. I was one, sir, in this interlude, one Sir Topas, sir, but that's all one. By the Lord, fool, I'm not mad. But do you remember, madam, why laugh you at such a barren rascal? And you smile not, he's gagged. And thus the whirligig of time brings in his revenges. So we can take that speech, the whirligig of time brings in his revenges. Remember that Viola left everything up to time, time thou must untangle this, not I. <clears throat> it has punished all those that were sentimentalists, but it also has redeemed them if they will to be redeemed. So it's brought in not only its revenges, but its healing. Time brought Viola to Olivia, but time also brought Sebastian to Olivia, and she ended up marrying the right one. Time brought the punishment to Malvolio that he deserved for mistreating the fool, <clears throat> and time brought the real spouse to Orsino, not the fake imaginary one. Malvolio's not buying it. I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you. And he runs out. So as I said, he's the humorous man. And the Duke kindly says, uh, Olivia says he hath been most notoriously abused. And the Duke says, pursue him and entreat him to a peace. And we are left to decide whether we hope that he'll accept the peace and make peace and see his own errors and come around, or, or whether he won't and whether he will maintain the grudge and maintain the self-importance and so on. The same way we're left to imagine about um, Sir Andrew, whether he'll have anything to do with Sir Toby anymore or not, or Toby with him. But at least we're left with pursue him and entreat him to a peace so that the happy ending that the whirly gig of time brings around is at least potentially complete. He hath not told us of the captain yet, so he's got to come back and tell us about the captain that he caused to be put in jail. When that is known and golden time convince, a solemn combination shall be made of our dear souls. Meantime, sweet sister, we will not part from hence. Cesario, come, for so you shall be while you are a man, but when in other habits you are seen, Orsino's mistress and his fancy's queen. Now his fancy, that fantasy of Olivia, has shifted to the right spot. Why? Because he knows Cesario from the inside, right? There's a real relationship there. And so reality supplants fantasy or, or sentimentality, and therefore the, happy, the ending is happy. So we talked about the song already. Um, I have a couple of general points I want to make about Shakespeare's technique, but first let me take questions if you have any, or comments, or mysteries, or frustrations, or what? Yeah? The captain's reference to his love for Sebastian, 
Antonio, you mean? Antonio. Yes. Oh, that's interesting. It's not meant to be God's love literally, but <clears throat> it's meant to be an example of how human beings ought to relate to other human beings who are good. So last week, I, had a, I mean, Tuesday, I had a whole talk about that, this friendship. It's, a, it's the ideal male friendship of uh, 2,000 years of classical and Christian history. Um, and it's passionate and romantic, which Shakespeare believed in, or we wouldn't have his sonnets. But it's not sexual. And I, I talked a lot about that, so I won't repeat myself. Um, it's not a direct image of the divine, but it is an image of what human beings are at their best and how they can love each other selflessly. So the whole point of Antonio's life in this play is that he's willing to go into danger, willing to give up his possessions, willing to suffer as long as Sebastian doesn't suffer. And that selflessness is a pure kind of agopic love. But Shakespeare ties it to um, a very powerful, passionate, romantic love that is not sexual, but is intense and psychic and, and based on character, and not just based on externals. Um, and it's similar to what's been building between Cesario, presumably Cesario, and, and Duke Orsino. They're, they're building that kind of trust and that deep understanding of one another. Um, before he ever knows that it's a girl, so that there's something real there. And the same with Olivia. She's building that with Sebastian, though she doesn't know it, because she's building it with Cesario. And, the, and she's moved by the real character of this person. And then Sebastian steps in to the breach to be the male version of that, um, so she can live happily ever after. So they're, they're all parallels of each other, which brings me to one of the things I want to talk about, which is just the idea of the foil. Um, in, in Shakespeare, uh, do you remember what foil means? A foil is, uh, originally, foil is um, metal beaten flat, like paper thin metal. We have tin foil, they had gold foil and silver foil. And they would use it in middle, medieval times and Renaissance as background to jewels. So you set a jewel against a reflecting gold foil or, or uh, silver foil, and the light reflects back through the jewel, and it, it sets it off by contrast. So it's doing two things. It's reflecting the light back through it. It's setting off dark background and light jewel. So uh, that term has been taken over to describe characters in a play who are, in a sense, there to uh, set off by contrast, by similarity and contrast other characters. The thing about, Sh so, and we can point to, you know, I mean, uh, we can point to characters who, are, who have obvious foils. At Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's art brings him, especially in the higher period, but even from early on, to recognize that it, if he wants to unify the theme of a play, Everybody in the play is a foil for everybody else in some way. So that the, the, the fool's festy song at the end goes through the list of the characters, you know, and the morality to be learned from each kind of adventure. Swag, by swaggering, you couldn't thrive in marriage, and tosspats have drunken heads, so that's Sir Toby, and that's Malvolio. And, um, and the point is that every character sheds light on every other character. Um, so the, the, similarly, the friendship between Antonio and Sebastian is this ideal friendship, but it's the, it's the image of what ought to be in all these relations. And what's the foil for it? It's Sir Andrew and Sir Toby, right? Sir Toby is just using Andrew for his money. And, knows he's a fool, but defends him and, and plays with him because he reinforces his, 
his eternal twelfth night antics. Um, and it's not a real friendship at all. And we can see how he turns on him at the end. He turns on him, you, a fool, an idiot, get out. Just as Antonio felt that Sebastian was turning on him when Viola said, I don't know who you are. <laughs> I don't know you. But it wasn't really that. So the, the point of that is to get us down to what is real. The, the friendship between Sir Toby and Sir Andrew is not a friendship. The friendship between Antonio and Sebastian is. That's a long answer to a short question, but a good one. I mean, a good question. <laughs> Others? All right, I have 10 minutes. I want to add a couple of things. <clears throat> Really one, because uh, we've talked about the others. We talked about prose and verse. We talked about particular and universal and variation and foils. So the, the last thing I want to talk about is antithesis. When you're reading Shakespeare, so if you are all actors acting in Shakespeare, I would work you very hard at learning how to say clearly the antithesis in any line. Because Shakespeare's whole drama is built out of antitheses. It's built out of large antitheses of character versus character, and of the good guy versus bad guy. Um, but it's also built in every instant, in every line almost, out of antitheses, because that makes for drama, that makes for conflict. And so part of the trick of reading Shakespeare um, profitably is to, is to attend to the antithesis, not just in the speech or in the between the characters, but within the line. So let's give an example. Uh, Let's go back to Viola's great speech about the ring. It's probably the most famous speech in the play. Or even before that, let's look at Sebastian to Antonio. It's even in prose, it's not even poetry, and yet watch how he does it. Uh, act two, scene one, line 33. Or line 31, we'll start there. Or let's go to 29. <laughs> Wherever I look, there's antithesis. In 29, Antonio says, pardon me, sir, your bad entertainment. So that's an antithesis there. Good entertainment should be good. But this is the opposite. This is a kind of uh, oxymoron, right? Bad entertainment. And Sebastian says, oh, good Antonio, forgive me your trouble. So entertainment is the antithetical to trouble. So one says entertainment, the next one says trouble. Then Antonio says, if you will not murder me for my love, let me be your servant. Murder me for my love. It's as opposite as you can get. It's what the Duke comes to almost at the end. He's ready to go murder Cesario. So it's not an impossible thing to happen, but it's absolute opposition in terms of general understanding of life. And his answer, Sebastian's, is if you will not undo what you have done, so there's antithesis, undo, done. That is, kill him whom you have recovered. There's an antithesis. Kill and recover. Desire it not. Fare you well at once. My bosom is full of kindness, and I am yet so near the manners of my mother that upon the least occasion more my eyes will tell tales of me. I want... To, I feel like weeping, and I don't want to weep. So here's the antithesis. A man shouldn't be weeping for nothing, but he's close to tears because of this love and what it's meant to him. And then Antonio says, The gentleness of all the gods go with thee. I have many enemies in Orsino's court, else I would very shortly see thee there. Else shows the opposition. I have enemies, or else I would be there. I can't be there because I have enemies. But come what may I do adore thee so, the danger shall seem sport. There's an antithesis within the line. 
and I will go. But the whole speech is an antithesis, right? I'm not going to go. I've got a lot of enemies there. But you know what? I'm going to go. <laughs> so the bigger antithesis is made up of the littler antithesis all the time. I left no ring with her. So she's holding the ring. I left no... Uh, here, says Malvolio. Returning the ring you gave to her. And she lies, Viola, as Cesario. She took the ring of me, I'll none of it. Like, I don't want it. <laughs> she said she took the ring of me, let her keep it. No, and he throws it down. So Viola picks it up. I left no ring with her. What means this lady? Fortune forbid my outside have not charmed her. <clears throat> she made good view of me. Indeed, so much that as me thought her eyes had lost her tongue. There's an antithesis. The eyes and the tongue, the eyes cause the tongue, the eyes function cause, this is cause, the eyes function causes the tongue to lose its function. That's the antithesis. For she did speak and starts distractedly. So that's kind of a hidden antithesis because to speak means to organize your thoughts and convey and communicate. And she's doing it in starts distractedly as if she's mad. She loves me sure. The cunning of her passion invites me in this churlish messenger. Okay, cunning and passion, they're not exactly opposites, but she, she is driven by the passion to invent this cunning, this invention of the ring. And then invites me in this churlish messenger. So she's got this, churl, this churl, this nasty, insulting man, bringing an invitation of love. So that's an antithesis built into the plot, <laughs> right? A positive message being carried by a negative person. None of my Lord's ring, why he sent her none. I am the man, not my Lord, I. There's an antithesis. If it be so as tis, poor lady, she were better love a dream. It is so, but it's not, right? She, it is so that she loves me, but she can't, it's, Useless. It, she might as well love a dream. <clears throat> Disguise, I see thou art a wickedness wherein the pregnant enemy does much. How easy is it for the proper false? That's an antithesis. It's an oxymoron. The proper false. The proper means the handsome on the outside. False on the inside. Usually they shouldn't go together, but here they do. How easy is it for the proper false in women's waxen hearts to set their forms? Alas, our frailty is the cause, not we, for such as we are made of, such we be. How will this fadge? So then we have a triple arrangement going on. My master loves her. I am fond on him. She mistaken seems to dote on me. As I am man, my state is desperate for my master's love. As I'm woman, there's the antithesis, obvious. What thriftless sighs shall poor Olivia breathe? O oh, time, thou must untangle this, not I. Time versus I, okay? Twelfth night versus what you will. And she is giving up the I in favor of time. She's giving up what you yourself will, that sentimentality we talked about, in favor of this bigger reality that contains them all. It is too hard a knot for me to untie. So knot and untie. Antithesis. What do you do with the knot? You tie it. So tie it, untie it. So that's just a, t a tiny little series of examples of how both on the large scale drama and in every single line, almost every line, I should say, there is this, this um, inherent dynamic of contrast that makes tension and that makes uh, not only the, the play and the characters dramatic, but makes every line potentially dramatic. <sighs> okay, questions? What? I have an idea. Um, 
He wrote 37 plays in 24 years. And uh, in some years he wrote more because the theaters were closed for, uh, because of the plague. Uh, and other years he was busier performing. But he, it, so it, it took, you know, it's a, it's a little less than two a year, approximately. Um, it's three to five months, depending. But here's my, you know, so, so everybody says to me, how could he have written so many great plays? <laughs> and my answer is, how could he have written one? <laughs> if you're a professional playwright and you're writing plays all your life, you know, you're going to write a lot of plays. The question is, not, how can they be great, so great, all of them? Not because there are so many great ones, but because any one of them is so great. So if he can write one of them, he can write all of them over the course of a lifetime. But how can he write one of them? That's a mystery. Nobody knows the answer to that. I have a lot of, an, uh, you know, intermediate answers. One of them is this technique of variation that he's completely mastered, and one of them is a phenomenal memory, and one of them is a great knack for what people care about. And I mean, I could go on and on, but how it all comes together in one imagination at that time, and nobody else like him in the world. I mean, a lot of people use it to a certain degree, um, and after Shakespeare, more people use it because they see. At the time, there, people are using it, but they're just not as good. They're just not as good. Marlowe's good, but he's not that good. He's good. He's better than most of the others, almost any of the others. But he's not Shakespeare. And you can tell when you read it. But it's so interesting how he, um, he uh, uh, puts in the iambic pentameter and then the couplets and then how he, he smiths the words to be perfectly. Yeah, and it's because when you're doing that all your life, you feel it. It's a knack, you know? It's like, it's like driving. If somebody said to you, how can you remember to turn the turn signal at the same time you're braking when you're coming to an intersection? Like, how can you remember to do that? What a genius, you know? Well, it's because you've done it so many times and it's, it, it's part of your nature and you... So if you think in iambic pentameters and if you think in metaphors and in antitheses and, and your whole training is you know, to, to arrange and dispose all this knowledge and all these ideas that you've absorbed from school because he grew up reading all the Latin classics um, and <clears throat> everything he could get his hands on, he had a phenomenal memory. So he's just used to doing that. But the, the real question is, I mean, there are a lot of people that could just spout iambic pentameter. I can probably do it if you want me to. But to do it so well, <laughs> so perfectly and so consistently and profoundly and differently, like it's, it changes. Over time, Shakespeare goes from a lot of end stopped lines to a lot of enjambed lines. Do you remember what that means? I, I, I thought I explained it last week. An end stop line, <clears throat> the grammar ends at the end of the line. Uh, and in, in jammed line, the grammar, there's no punctuation or pause. The grammar wraps on to the next line. So let me give you an example. Um, so when she says, oh, time, thou must untangle this, not I, pause, semicolon, it is too hard a knot for me to untie. That's, those are called end stopped lines. That also happens to be a rhyme, but that's not so important right now. But um, when she says, how easy is it for the proper false in women's waxen hearts to set their forms? The line is, how easy is it for the proper false in women's waxen heart, hearts to set their forms? There's no pause there. It's the, the proper false in women's wax and hearts to set there. It's all one thought. So we call that an enjambment, like a door jam. Late in his career, Shakespeare is writing only in enjambed lines, almost entirely. And early in his career, almost entirely in end stopped lines. So he just, he kind of grows into this. And of course, in all the plays, there's variety, there's both. But it just, it, it becomes more fluid as he gets older and just more masterful. And that's why things like the late plays, uh, the late romances and King Lear are so overwhelming because his, 
his knack is so perfectly developed and his attention is now on such profound ideas. And they come together and that's it. What can you say? Well, I won't say any more for tonight. Thank you for being here. And um, I will see you Tuesday and we'll begin talking about King Lear. <laughs>